from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Beta Vichai. Dr. Miriam Goldstein is an associate professor of Arabic at the Department of Arabic Language and Literature at the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem. Dr. Goldstein will be leading us in this series, Judeo Arabic, its literature, and why it matters. Now, we don't expect you to speak or understand Arabic, but thanks to Miriam, we, we will learn about an historical era unknown to many. Thank you very much. Hi to all. Thank you very much, Tamar. It's a real pleasure to be here at Beit Avichai in Jerusalem. I'm Dr. Miriam Goldstein. I'm on faculty at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in the Department of Arabic Language and Literature. And I'm really excited to be here with you today to talk to you about Jews and Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, its literature, and why it matters. Thank you to Beit Avichai for the invitation. What I want to do in this three-part series is to give you a brief introduction to the Jewish use of Arabic and why it's important. In lecture one, I'm gonna give you an introduction to the concept. In this first session, we're going to hear about Jews in Arabic, why Jews began to use Arabic, when Jews began to use Arabic, how it happened and where, and why it is so important for the Jewish community then, now, why it is so important that we know about this Jewish use of Arabic. In our second session, I'll talk about the new Jewish bookshelf. I want to talk about on the ground what changed, examples of new works that were written once Jews began using Arabic, examples of texts, so you can see what is different. Even people who don't read or work in Judeo-Arabic, as I do, and you'll learn very much what is Judeo-Arabic today, will be able to note the influence even in what they read today. Even if you're reading in Hebrew or in other Jewish languages, I promise you that after session two, you will be able to understand why Judeo-Arabic literature was so important for what you read today. And in session three, how does it read in Arabic? We're going to focus in on the Bible. I'm going to bring textual examples from one of the fields I'm specialized in, in Judeo-Arabic, which is Bible commentary. And I want to show you in detail what is different and what is new. Um, and I'm going to exemplify it on the field of Bible commentary in that third session, but we could exemplify it in any one of a number of varied fields in which Jews wrote in Judeo-Arabic. So first of all, our title for today. And I called this session, Speaking, Reading, and Writing Arabic, A Revolution in Jewish History. Why did I call it a revolution? Um, because the most important thing that I want you to realize today is the significance, the incredibly revolutionary significance of the spread of the Arabic language among Jews in the medieval period. When Jews adopted Arabic, speaking Arabic, reading Arabic, and writing Arabic, this changed the face of Jewish scholarship and culture entirely. And that is what I want to teach you about today. So, by the end of our session, you're going to be an expert and you will understand what the change is, how it happened, and exactly why it's important. And then we'll continue in our next session, sort of uh, putting flesh on that idea. Um, scholarship before the adoption of Arabic and scholarship after the adoption of Arabic, Jewish scholarship, were two very different things. There was continuity. Can, this is not to say that Jews writing before the period of adoption of Arabic were doing something entirely, entirely different. However, the adoption of Arabic took our literature and our bookshelf in new and innovative directions, and that's what I want to talk about today. And I called the series Speaking, Reading, and Writing because this change was gradual. It surely began with speaking, it likely continued with reading, and the efflorescence of this phenomenon happened with writing. Um, now let's talk about time periods, about places, um, in order for you to understand exactly what I'm talking about. So what you're looking at here is a folio of a manuscript, which was copied in the medieval period. It's a work by a Karaite Jew. We're going to talk about the Karaites a little bit today and more in the upcoming sessions, but a medieval Arabic-speaking Jew who happened to be a Karaite named Yaqub al kirkisani Yaqub is, of course, the Arabic Jacob. He was a native Arabic speaker, and he was active in the 10th century in Baghdad. 
And you're looking at a 14th century copying of his book called in Arabic, Kitab al-Riyad wal-Hadaiq, in English, the book of gardens and parks. And you're looking at the introduction. So you can see on the top right of the screen, uh, you can see a verse that is his introduction. And then you can see the beginning of his introduction itself, where I will read to you a little bit, and you can very much feel him as an author. So we are talking about a work written in the 10th century. Okay, the copying is from the 14th century, but the work was written in the 10th century. And I'm bringing this to you as an example to focus us in on what was so new about Jews writing in Arabic and everything can be talked about with reference to this one page. Of course, there are more slides in my presentation, but we're going to focus for now on this one page in order to front some of the very important issues that we're going to talk about. So first of all, if you look at this manuscript, all of you are hopefully saying to yourselves, what script is that in? That's Hebrew script. So it's in Hebrew script, and it's the Arabic language. So I'll read you the first line or two, so you can hear that it's actually Arabic. I'll convince you that it's Arabic. So, inni ba'd an faraghtu min ta'alif hadha al-kitab fi ma'ani al-Tawrah, alati hiya ghair al-Faraid, ta'amaltu ma'amiltuhu fi tafsir bereshit. You heard one word in, in Hebrew, that was bereshit. But other than that, what you heard was Arabic. So what you see in front of you is Arabic in Hebrew script. And this is characteristic of many, many works that Jews wrote in Arabic beginning in the 9th century. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So first of all, it's, it's Arabic. It's a Jew for whom it is very natural to sit down in the 10th century and write his Bible commentary in Arabic. Okay, so the first thing is the language and the script. Now, the second thing I want to point out is his authorial awareness. So the lines I read in Arabic, um, we'll translate them officially in a second, but pretty much the translation, and this is a work, by the way, that I do research on, and we're going to look more at um, in this session and in the upcoming sessions. Um, I do work on Yaqub al-Kirkasani's um, Pentateuch commentary, his commentary on the five books of Moses. Um, it says, I, after I finished composing this book about the meanings of the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, which don't have to do with commandments, I looked at what I did in the commentary on Genesis and. And then he describes. And this is a section that we're going to look at um, a little bit more in detail later on. But the important thing is the author is entirely present in this introduction. So those of you who are familiar with earlier Jewish literature, not written in Arabic, for example, well, the Bible or the Midrash, uh, works, you know, from the second century and onward, or the Talmud, a work that was um, finally canonized uh, around the end of the fifth century. This kind of authorial presence, I, he's talking about I, he's talking about his work. This is new. This is very new in Jewish writing in Arabic, and it's one of the very salient features of what we're going to see that was new when Jews began to write in Arabic. Okay, so authorship is the next important thing that we see in these pages right in front of us. Um, and then comes up uh, in the second paragraph, if you look on our first page, which is, which is on the right of the screen, and you can see um, there's a, a, a gap in the middle, and then there's a new paragraph. And you see the word, if those of you who can see the letters in the Hebrew script, bereshit, uh, the first word of the book of Genesis, and the author begins to, con to continue on a word-by-word -word commentary on the book of Genesis. This, too, is new. The idea that an author would sit down and say, I, the author, I am now going to write a commentary word-by-word, verse-by-verse on the Torah, on the, the Torah of Moses, on the Pentateuch. This, too, is new. This was a new way of looking at the idea of writing a Bible commentary. And it was not unique at all. In the 10th century, it was entirely usual for an author to sit down and say, I am going to now interpret the entire Torah, the entire Bible. I am going to begin to do it verse by verse. So there are many, many new elements 
that we can see represented in this page, this introductory page of Yaqub al kirkisani's work. Um, so this was to, get, to give you a feel for all of the new things. Now let's look at the text itself. And by looking at the text, we're going to be able to understand in depth what are the new elements? What is this idea, an authorial introduction? And after that, we're going to talk more about the general contours. How did we get here? How did we get to the place where a 10th century author would write something like this? So he begins, and this is the actual introduction to his 10th century Bible commentary, or his 10th century Pentateuch commentary. When I finished composing this book on the interpretations of the Torah, so he's writing after he's already written the thing, those which relate to the non-legal parts of the Torah, what's not commandments, I considered what I had done in my interpretation of the weekly portion of Genesis, and I found it to be extremely long. I had discussed rational and philosophical issues at such length that the literary or scriptural issues were nearly drowning in them, a very graphic description, to the point that the reader would arrive at an understanding of most of them only after being exhausted by prolonged reading. So we can understand a number of important things from the way al kirkisani begins his commentary. First of all, he's completely self-aware as an author. He's there, he composed this book, he finishes writing this book, which was um, a, book, a commentary on the Pentateuch, and he looked at what he did for the weekly portion of Genesis, which by the way, it's important for you to know, was often the most complex section of commentaries on Genesis. So it's not, it's not strange that he says, well, I looked at what I did in what we would call Parashat Bereshit, the weekly portion of Genesis, and I saw that it was entirely complex. In what ways is it complex? What he says is he had put in too much discussion of the rational and philosophical issues, that this was just a very heavy work, too philosophical, too rational. And we must remember, and we will learn more about this in very much the next few minutes, Baghdad at the time, where al Kirkasani lives, lived, was one of, was the world center of philosophical and rational speculation. This was the pumping heart of any kind of work on philosophy that was happening in the world. And I'm, I will talk about that more in a minute. But the important thing is that al Kirkasani was looking at what he had written, and he said, I, I just made this too complex. This commentary that I wrote on the weekly portion of Genesis is way too complex, and he has his reader in mind. And having the reader in mind is another very prominent aspect of writing by Jews in the 10th century. When we read the Bible, when we read the Midrash, when we read the Talmud, the Talmud does not talk to us, O oh, reader. In the 10th century in Judeo-Arabic, works did. And, and we will talk about this more, that the reader is very present. al Kirkasani is aware of his reader, and he's saying, I just wrote in a way that's going to be way too tiresome to the reader. What does he say? He says, I feared, the I, I feared that many of those who read it would be repelled by its length and might even rebuke me for this or perhaps even find fault with me. I therefore saw fit to abbreviate it and to bring together in it the literary scriptural issues with a small measure of the rational and philosophical issues. In this way, it will be easy for the reader who wishes to memorize it. Memorizing was an important aspect of learning in that period, in the 10th century. And especially for someone who preaches to the people in synagogues. So al Kirkasani says that he took action. He's describing to us in this introduction the kind of things that he decided to do after he looked over his work and he said, this is too difficult. I am going to abbreviate it and I am going to make it easier for the reader to read. And we have the original, we have the original long version, and we also have the shorter abbreviated version, which is part of my research project on al Kirkasani. This is my English translation of his Judeo-Arabic. He says, I will mention in this shortened version some, but not all, of my answers to scriptural explanations and issues. Likewise, I will omit the 37 principles that I established as a foundation for interpreting the meaning of the book. So he explains, this is an abbreviation, 
And furthermore, he had a very long, and by the way, fascinating, introduction where he talks about 37 principles of how to explain the Bible. This is a fascinating text, but he says, I did not include it in this abbreviated version of my commentary on Parashat Bereshit, on the beginning of Genesis. Then he says, therefore, anyone who wants to acquaint himself with them, as well as to know all of the rational matters and answers to literary or scriptural questions that I have omitted, can see them there in the original long version. And now I will begin with the help of God, a religious time. It's always with the help of God. Um, so you can see that al Kirkisani is, first of all, aware of himself as an author. He's very aware of his readers and what will work for his readers. And Finally, he explains to us exactly the steps that he has taken as an author to make his work accessible for all, for somebody who wants to memorize it, for somebody who's speaking to people in synagogue. He's very, very clear about his audience. This introduction is very emblematic of Jewish writing in Judeo-Arabic, beginning towards the late 9th century and certainly in the 10th century. Um, and what you cannot see here is the continuation of his commentary, which also has incredibly new content, um, which we will talk about more in upcoming sessions. I'm going to give you examples of the types of things we might find in Bible commentaries, like Kirkasani's. This will be in the third session. But much of what is, you have seen in front of you so far is new. If we were to look at Jewish writing prior to the adoption of Arabic, we would not see these aspects, this forward-looking forward authorship, this idea that the audience, well, I have my reader in mind, and then the, the content is quite different. It is, there is continuity with the past, but there is much, much uh, in 10th century Judeo-Arabic writing, which is new, which is innovative. Now, what I want to talk to you is how did we get here? How did we get to the place where a Jew is writing the way al kirkasani does. And you're going to see other examples, not just al kirkasani So we're looking at a map of Jewish communities under Muslim rule. This is the area that we are talking about in the, this session and the next two sessions. You're looking at the Middle East. You're looking at what's called the Mediterranean Basin. Um, what I want to do is show you how we got to this map. This is a map of major Jewish communities in the Arabic-speaking world. The reason there are different shades of blue on this map, which I took from a wonderful historical atlas edited and created by Eli Barnavi, who's a professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel. Um, the dark blue that you see in the Arabian Peninsula, today Saudi Arabia, Medina, and Mecca, that shows the beginnings of the spread of Islam, which I'm about to talk about more. And then the lighter blue, you can see the spread of the Islamic empire, which brought not only Islam, but also Arabic. And that's the importance for us. Um, and in the numbers on the map, you can see the dates that different areas were conquered by the Islamic armies, by the armies of Islam. So this is a very important map that we will be returning to. We will be focusing in this series on writing that occurred in Baghdad, which doesn't appear on the map because it was founded in 750 as the capital of what's called the Abbasid Empire. So you don't see it on this map. Um, and we will also be talking about writing that took place in Jerusalem and a little bit about writing that took place in Egypt in what's marked on the map as Fustat. Um, so how did, we, how did we get to this map where we have Jewish communities who are Arabic speaking, who are ruled by Islamic empires. So I must first take you back to late antiquity. So you're looking here at the exact same area, which is outlined um, to show the outlines of the two most important empires prior to the rise of Islam. So in the east, you have the Sasanian Empire, who spoke a, a type of early Persian who were of the Zoroastrian religion. So that's the empire in the east, which ruled in areas that are today Iraq, Iran, um, parts of areas around the Caspian Sea. And in the west, you see uh, the remains of the Roman Empire, 
which ruled um, in the northern area of North Africa, certainly areas that are today the land of Israel, parts of the Middle East, today's Turkey, Anatolia, parts of Greece, Italy. This is Rome. Okay, so we have the Sasanian Empire and we have the late Roman Empire. What happened? Um, if you look, Saudi Arabia is not included, today's Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. So what happened was, uh, around the year 610, the early 7th century, a charismatic trader, he was a trader, he worked in trade and traveled extensively in the Near East, named Muhammad ibn Abdullah, began to receive revelations. This is the year 610. Um, this is according to the Muslim narrative. He begins to receive revelations. Um, he's living in a place called Mecca. Um, and he begins to receive what he believes are revelations from God, from a God named Allah. He's surrounded by polytheists. And he begins to preach, he begins to, preach to these polytheists about the idea of worshiping a single God. Um, the language spoken in the Arabian Peninsula and other areas of the Near East is Arabic, and Muhammad's revelations are in Arabic. Um, so these revelations go on. Muhammad encounters resistance, but he amasses around him a group of people who believe in his revelations and who believe that what he's hearing is, is the word of the one God. In the year, he continues to receive revelations over a period of time. This is what becomes the Quran. In the year uh, 632, Muhammad dies. His followers and he have already begun to conquer areas immediately around Mecca and Medina, another important city to Islam. Um, and they have already begun to establish a core which will become the core of the new Muslim empire. Following Muhammad's death, Islam does not end, Islam spreads. And the armies that Muhammad already has, has begun to guide move out. They move out north, they move out east, they move out west, and they begin to conquer. Um, and this is the rise and spread of Islam from Mecca, where Muhammad was born, probably uh, towards the late 6th century, probably around the year 570. Mecca, where he begins to receive his revelations in 610, as I said. Medina, where he moves to, this is the beginning of the Muslim calendar in 622. In 632, as I said, Muhammad dies and his armies begin to spread even further than the initial spread. This is what becomes the Muslim empire. And I've brought you a map here of its largest extent in the 9th century under the Abbasids. Now, what is important to realize about the spread of Islam is that the spread of Islam is far more than just the spread of a religion. The spread of a religion is a huge thing. Islam really takes over much of the Near East. Uh, living in the Near East and North Africa, the Mediterranean, are Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, all different types of religions. Many of the inhabitants of this region convert to Islam and some Jews, by the way, convert to Islam. This is a continuing process. Many Christians convert to Islam. For our purposes, what is important is the adoption of the Arabic language. So if we looked at this map, and I said that Arabic is the language spoken in the Arabian Peninsula and other areas to the north of it in the Near East, the Muslim conquest of the Near East is incredibly successful in spreading the Arabic language. And if you remember where the Jewish communities were in the map I showed in the beginning, you see that Jewish communities are spread throughout the area that becomes Islamic ruled. Whereas Jews were earlier divided among two empires, the Sasanian Empire on the one hand and the late Roman or Byzantine Empire on the other hand, at this point we have Jews, this is 90% of the Jewish population of the world who are unified under the Islamic empire. And for Jews, this is incredibly important, not for, for two major reasons. One is the political unification. Now a Jew who's sitting in today's Morocco and a Jew who's sitting in today's Persia are now unified under the same political entity. And second of all, linguistically, 
In many cases, these Jews will now, over a period of time, be speaking the same native language. Now, I want to explain a little bit more about why this is important for Jews. So if you look at this region, which I just said 90% of the world's Jewish population is resident in, there occurred a linguistic change. So I said that the beginnings of the spread of Islam were in the 7th century. Muhammad, who dies in 632, his army spread. They create what you see in front of you on the map. They create this huge empire. I've brought you the outlines of the 9th century, but this was pretty much the outlines even by the early 8th century. So we're talking about a very quick spread of a new religion and a very quick spread of a new political reality and an incredibly quick spread of a new language. Gradually, the communities of the region, Jews, Christians, others, began to leave aside their ancient languages that they had spoken, and Jews were native speakers largely of Aramaic prior to the rise of Islam, and they began to take on Arabic as a spoken language. And the reason I brought this map from the ninth century was that by the time we get to the ninth century, Jews are, for the most part, and this is to leave out Iran, because in Iran, most people continue to speak Persian, but in areas that are not Iran. So we're talking about from today's Iraq and all the way west to Al-Andalus, the Iberian Peninsula, Morocco, North Africa, Arabic has become the native language of a huge percentage of the world's Jewish population. Now, why is this important? You may be thinking to yourselves, yes, another Jewish language. We know of a lot of Jewish languages, Yiddish, Judeo-Persian, Ladino. The claim that I want to make today is that Judeo-Arabic is unique among the Jewish languages because of the intellectual atmosphere of what you see in front of you. And for this, we have to take a brief, brief foray into Islamic history. So you see in front of you the Abbasid Empire in the 9th century. So what is interesting about what happened when the uh, Islamic Empire was being set up is that, as you see, incorporated in this empire is the cradle of ancient civilization. We have the former Roman Empire, we have the Sasanian Empire. All of this became subsumed in the Islamic Empire. This meant incredible treasures of knowledge. This meant philosophy, this meant linguistics, this meant science, this meant medicine. What happened was, when the Abbasid Empire was established in 750, um, what happened was the, the Muslim empires, the Muslim armies go out, the Umayyad Empire is the first one that was established. Those of you who have visited Jerusalem, for example, may have seen the Umayyad palaces in the area of the Western Wall of the Kotel. Um, and there's much more remains of the Umayyads, of course, throughout the Near East. In 750, the Abbasids overtake the Umayyads and they establish a capital in Baghdad. And not only do they establish a capital in Baghdad, replacing the Umayyad capital of Damascus, they begin a uh, translation movement. They realize, and this, there's fascinating research on this, they realize that these treasures of Greek civilization, works in Greek, works in Sanskrit, works in Pahlavi, early Persian, they, and they bring translators to their court, and they begin to sponsor translations. And many of you may know that the reason that Aristotle, that Aristotle's works could even get to Europe um, in the later medieval period is because they had passed via translation into Arabic. And this is when it happened. So beginning with the first caliphs of the Abbasid Empire, beginning in the year 750 and continuing throughout the second half of the 8th century, there is a huge, massive, very important translation movement in which treasures of world civilization are translated from Greek, from Sanskrit, from Pahlavi um, into Arabic. This meant that the Jew, also the Christian, but we're talking about the Jews today, um, also the Manichaean and the Zoroastrian, but I'm focusing today on Jews, who adopt or who begin to adopt Arabic as a native language are sitting in the place where it's all happening. 
This means that the Jew, who in the ninth century is already a native speaker of Arabic, and I say this often to my students at the Hebrew University, yes, I teach native Hebrew speakers and native Arabic speakers, and I say, yes, they're native Arabic speakers, just like those around you today. They are able to read the treasures of the Greek world in their native language, works of Aristotle on philosophy, works on theology, works on linguistics, works on science. They are in the heart of learned civilization of the world. So this is what I want to convince you. This is what is so special about Judeo-Arabic as a Jewish language, that not only is this an example of Jews acculturating to a culture around them, to a new language, by doing so, Jews were acculturating to the world language of civilization at the time. And they had access in this way to the latest and most important things that were happening in nearly any field that you might want to talk about. Okay, so this is the change that led to the page of manuscript that we looked at, where Yaqub al Kirkasani is writing in Arabic and he's talking about philosophy, and he's talking about rational issues, and he's an author, and he has his reader in mind. Taking on Arabic meant that Jews became part of the scholarly center of the world. Now what I want to do is to show you a number of artifacts from um, this period, from the period in which Jews were undergoing the transition from what I said was their ancestral language to the adoption of Arabic. And I want to bring you two very important and central textual sources from the 9th century, okay, so a little bit before the text we looked at with al Kirkasani, to, to bring you two artifacts that will demonstrate this linguistic change. And it wasn't so smooth. It wasn't that everybody was like, okay, Jews are now speaking Arabic, great, let's go for it. No, and I want to bring you a dissenter a dissenting voice and the idea that this transition was a gradual one. The adoption of Arabic was gradual. So the person I want to talk to you about is a Gaon. Um, not Gaon as in the Hebrew word for genius, but Gaon as in one of the leaders, one of the religious and spiritual leaders of the Jewish community in this period. His name is Natronai Ben Hilai Gaon and he lived in the second half of the ninth century. He led the yeshiva of Sura, one of the Gaonic Academy, for approximately 10 years, and he wrote a lot. He was a very prolific writer of chuvot, of responsa literature. And I'm quoting here from a text that was published by my Hebrew University colleague, Robert Brody, um, who published it in a volume of responsa from uh, Natronai Gaon that he collected from manuscript. Um, and I'm reading you in, in my translation into English. So Rav Natronai Gaon says, those who do not read the Aramaic Targum, but say, we should not read the Rabbinic Targum, but rather should translate the Torah into our own language, the language that the congregation can understand, have not fulfilled their obligation. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Um, so first of all, what is the Targum? So the Targum is what um, some of you might know as Targum Onkelos, a work uh, written in the second century, a translation of the Pentateuch, of the five books of Moses, into Aramaic, into the Aramaic that was spoken at the time. And those of you who have on the shelf um, what's called a Mikraot Gudolot, um, a Torah with commentaries, can often see the Aramaic translation on the site. This is something that was created in the second century. Because Aramaic was the spoken language of Jews, Arabic had replaced Aramaic in the time that I'm talking about. And this is what I want to show you here. So Jews had spoken Aramaic for a long time. So this was created in the second century, this Targum Onkelos, in order to make the difficult verses of the Torah understandable to Jews who spoke Aramaic. Um, Rav Natronai Gaon in the 9th century is talking about the tradition of reading the Aramaic Targum in the synagogue alongside the reading of the Torah portion. And this is a custom that all Jews 
did in this time. Um, and it's a custom that is today preserved only in the Yemenite community. But at Natronai Gaon's time in the 9th century, this was the tradition. You would, when you would read the Torah ceremonially in synagogue on Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat, um, you would read a verse in the original Hebrew, of course, and then a verse in the Aramaic translation. And at the time, this was uh, in the second century when it was created and a bit on, this was so that everybody could understand. Biblical Hebrew is a very difficult text and they wanted everybody to understand in their native Aramaic. As you can see, by the time we get to the time of Rav Natronai Gaon, people are starting to move around and ask questions. And he reflects here a situation in which people are saying, hey, Aramaic is not our native language anymore. We don't understand the Targum anymore. We would like to translate the Torah into our own language. And obviously you can guess what is our own language in the ninth century in this community. We don't know which community it was that Natronai Gaon is responding to. It's Arabic. They want to read in synagogue a translation of the Torah into Arabic because this is what will help the synagogue goers understand the difficult biblical Hebrew verses. Does Natronai want to allow this? No. He says they have not filled their obligation. Meaning, he sees the idea of reading the Aramaic translation as a traditional obligation which you will do despite the fact that by the 9th century, the vast majority of Jewish communities are native Arabic speakers. And unless they're learned members of the community, they probably don't understand the Aramaic of the Targum. We know this from, from other texts as well. Um, so Natronai continues, and he's very harsh. If they do not read the Targum out of defiance, they should be excommunicated. And if because they are not capable of reading the Aramaic translation, they should learn to do so and read the Targum and so fulfill their duty. And of course, many Jews today, I, I, I'm actually among them, enjoy reading the Targum as another way to learn about the biblical text. So, and I'm certainly not a native speaker of Aramaic. So Natronai is saying this is something traditional. It is an obligation that must be fulfilled. I do not sanction the reading of an Arabic Arabic translation instead of the Aramaic. So this gives us a conception of the idea that the linguistic transition has happened. By the mid 9th century, by the time of Natronai Gaon, it is clear, if he's getting questions like this, that Jewish, many, many, if not all Jewish communities, and as I said, besides Iran, are native Arabic speakers. For them, it is most natural to read the Bible in an Arabic translation, if they're getting a translation. Of course, they're, they're working to learn the Hebrew, that's for sure, but their native language is Arabic and that's what they need. Ironically, in a generation or two or three, the Gaon himself, one of the successors of Rav Natronai Barhilai Gaon, Sa'adia Gaon, will compose his own canonical Arabic translation of the Torah, which if you ask Jews uh, born or, or with this, descendants of Jews from Arabic-speaking countries today. Oh, yes, the Sharh, the translation of Rav Sadia, yes, very important, completely canonical. So we go from a place where Rav Natronai is saying, no, you must continue with the Aramaic translation, to Rav Sadia, who himself, sitting in the position of power in the yeshiva, of sitting in Baghdad, the Gaonic yeshiva, um, is the author of an Arabic translation. And what I want to show you now is our second textual source is Rav Sadia's introduction to his canonical translation of, of the Torah, uh, of the Pentateuch. So first, a few words on Rav Sadia, who will be one of the stars of this series. Um, I'm a researcher of um, Karaite Jewish works in Judeo-Arabic, but I am also, um, as many of us, a student of Rav Saadia, a researcher of Rav Saadia. Um, Rav Saadia Gaon, he got the position of Gaon later in life. He was not born Gaon, he was born uh, Saadia ben Yosef al Fayumi. Al Fayumi, because he was born in a place near Fayum in Egypt in the year 862. And Rav Saadia was born in Egypt. He writes this introduction that you're looking at in Egypt. 
he travels, after writing this introduction, which he apparently wrote when he was young, um, he travels, and he travels through the land of Israel. He ends up in Baghdad. He becomes the Gaon, the leader of one of the yeshivot in Baghdad, the yeshiva of what's traditionally called the yeshiva of Surah, but it's in Baghdad. And he writes many, many important works in Judeo-Arabic. Rav Saadia is indeed one of the stars of Jewish composition in Judeo-Arabic, and he's a very, very important figure. So he was born in 862, and as you see, he died in 942. And what we are looking at is a fascinating testimony to his decision to translate the Torah uh, in a text that was discovered by my teacher and mentor, Professor Chagai ben Shammai, who is an emeritus professor of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who published this text in Arabic and in Hebrew translation. And um, Rav Sadia, of course, wrote it in Judeo-Arabic. Um, Chagai ben Shammai discovered it in manuscript, and I'm reading it to you in my English translation. So Saadia expresses here his hesitations before translating the Torah, and that's what I want to show you. Um, so he starts out, in God's name, the long introduction. He wrote a long introduction and a short introduction. So this one is the long introduction, which was the um, amazing discovery of Haggai ben Shammai. Blessed be God, the Lord of Israel, the one, the eternal, who speaks the truth in his promises, the loving, the compassionate. So this is a very classic way that Jewish writers writing in Arabic would introduce their works. For those of you who are familiar with medieval Jewish writing in general, in Hebrew, for example, um, this type of introduction was adopted into Hebrew from Arabic. So please remember that much of what you see in medieval Hebrew is adopted from um, models that exist in Judeo-Arabic. So this idea of blessing God in the beginning is one of them, a classic in Arabic and Judeo-Arabic and was adopted in later Hebrew uh, composition in medieval Hebrew. The composer of the book said, so he talks about himself in the third person, volition in which no time period interposes between it and the action intended is that of the eternal. When he, God, desires something to be, the thing occurs without any time between the volition and the created action. So what is Rav Saadia saying? He's about to contrast it, but stay with me for now. He's talking about God. And he says, God's will, God's volition, has no inter interference of time in between God deciding that something's going to happen and the thing happening. There's no time period between the decision and the action. That is God. That's the eternal. God desires something to be. It is. And by the way, this is a classic adaption, adaptation of lines that appear in the Quran. But we, we don't have time to get into that now. But let us just say that Rav Saadia, when he speaks, he's speaking within the Arabic cultural orbit. This is perceived by the rational intellect. And you remember I said that Baghdad in this period is a center of the study of rationality and philosophy. Um, everybody, I mean, well, not everybody, we can never say everybody, but many, many Jewish, Muslim, Christian scholars during this time period believe that true learning, true science is based on using the rational intellect. So we'll always see this sort of two-part process between the rational intellect and scripture. And that's what you're about to see here. So this is perceived by the rational intellect. That is, that the creator does not need time to carry out his actions. He says it very plain. But it is also stated explicitly in scripture in describing the acts of God. So, and then he quotes two quotes from Psalms, two psukim, two verses from Psalms. For he spoke and it was, he commanded and it endured, i.e. God makes a decision and it happens immediately. And he sends forth his word to the earth, his command runs swiftly, i.e. there is no interference of time between his word, his command, and the carrying out. This is God, as you can imagine. Now Sa'adia is going to contrast himself and his decision to make a translation of the Torah. So now he, here's the contrast. Volition, in which there is a period of time in between it and the action intended, is the volition of human beings. We make decisions. We need time to carry them out. Why? 
because humans require time to plan the actions that they are hoping to accomplish, and all the more so to carry the actions out well, because they do things step by step. What can we do? We are not like God. God commands and it happens. We human beings need time. We need time to plan, to carry things out well, um, and we do things step by step. We cannot uh, carry things out in a split second like God. Um, this is all the more true if they are impeded by any sort of impediment. So there are, of course, um, the happenings of the time, you know, uh, things that can happen to stop our plans or to make our plans get carried out more slowly. We understand this all the more so. Saadia, writing in um, the late 9th or early 10th century, this was the medieval period. Of course, there were many impediments, probably more so than for us in modern times. And now Saadia says the personal part of his introduction. And of course, you recognize in this the same kind of personal approach that we saw when Yaqub al Kirkasani was speaking. So he says, while I was living in my hometown, and he means the little town in Egypt, um, it was called Dilas, where he grew up, I had long intended to compose for those of our religion a translated version of the Pentateuch, an appropriate one, and one which would accord with rational speculation as well as with rabbinic tradition. So Saadia says, I had always wanted to translate the Torah. And I wanted to translate, and he obviously means into Arabic, by the way. He doesn't say that, but he's writing this text in Judeo-Arabic, and he means in his native Arabic. Rav Saadia likely spoke Arabic like Egyptian films you might hear today. He likely spoke an Egyptian dialect of Arabic. So he thought about translating the Torah in a way that would comply with two important criteria. Number one, with rational speculation, Saadia, as I said, like many scholars of his day, believed that using rational speculation was the way to arrive at the truth. You could not just base yourself on tradition. You needed to use the tools of rational speculation that were being developed around him in Arabic, on the basis oftentimes, by the way, of Greek precursors. That's number one. Number two, rabbinic tradition. Rav Saadia was what we call a rabbinite Jew. A rabbinite Jew means somebody in the rabbinic fold as opposed to the Karaite Jews I mentioned earlier. So it would need also to accord with rabbinic tradition, with rabbinic interpretations of the Torah. Translation is obviously a, a process of interpretation. So his idea was that this translation would have to be a type of interpretation that accorded with the weighty tomes of rabbinic tradition, the Talmud, the Midrash, um, things that preceded him. However, says Saadia, I hesitated to take this on, fearing to display my inner beliefs in public, for I imagined that in faraway places distant from my hometown in Egypt, there existed clear and apt translations. So what was Saadia worried about? First of all, it would take time. He knew it would take time, and that's what he was talking about earlier. And he worried maybe somebody had already done this. And by the way, people had. There were, we heard from Natronai's text that there are translation in existence. Natronai served as Gaon a few generations before, of a few Geonim, a few people before Rav Saadia. Um, Rav Saadia took on the position about 50 years later. Um, there were translations into Arabic. However, note, that Saadia says an appropriate one. And it seems that Saadia had in mind a different type of translation. And we actually have the early translations and we certainly have Saadia's translation. He did decide to translate and it became an incredibly canonical text. Um, so Saadia did translate. Um, Saadia did decide to translate the Pentateuch and very, very quickly, his translation caught on to the point that it became the canonical translation very quickly for Jews, and it was even adopted by Christian communities. For example, the Coptic translation of the Pentateuch into Arabic today um, is very heavily based on Rav Saadia's translation from the Biblical Hebrew into Arabic. 
Um, so this is just what I wanted to express to you here. What I wanted to show you with this second text is the idea that while Rav Natronai, 50 years earlier, had said, no, 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 we have an Aramaic translation, the Targum, this is the one that must be used. 50 years later, plus minus, Rab Saadia not only um, affirms the need for a translation, he produces it himself. And he produces a translation that is so beautiful in Arabic that it becomes canonical among Jews and it is also adopted by non-Jews. Um, so Saadia was a visionary. Saadia was a visionary in saying to himself, and he really was one of the major figures responsible for this, saying, we must embrace this idea of Arabic. We keep the old, we keep the rabbinic tradition, we incorporate the rabbinic tradition into what we do, but we wholeheartedly adopt the use of our now native language, Arabic, for writing about Judaism. Um, we use the methods that we see around us. We use rational speculation. He also writes on philosophical issues and more and more. So Adia was very much a visionary in seeing that we must go with the flow. Arabic is around us. Arabic is our native language. Arabic is the intellectual language being used around us. We adopted it. And, and Sa'adia was very much the person in this period, the leader in the community, who sort of gave Arabic its hechsher. He gave it its certification that it was a language that could be used for all types of Jewish scholarship. Now, I want to conclude this session with the question of what is Judeo-Arabic? Because it's very important. I've, I've sort of given you the framework for understanding why it's important. Jews had used different languages in the earlier period, especially Aramaic. And starting with the Islamic conquest, gradually Arabic took over and became the primary intellectual, Jewish intellectual language by the late 9th, early 10th centuries. This was really, this was the language that a Jew who wanted to write scholarship would write in. Hebrew, to a much lesser extent, really what Jews wrote in scholarly, um, in, in scholarly contexts was written in Judeo-Arabic during this time period. Remember, I said 90% of the Jewish population of the world at this time is living in Arabic-speaking areas. They are native Arabic speakers. Now, we will talk about what is Judeo-Arabic. So what is this language we're talking about? And I'm sure you have many questions. I often get questions, literary Arabic versus spoken Arabic, Hebrew letters versus Arabic letters. So I want to set um, a few things straight. Um, so Judeo-Arabic can look like this. And this is a manuscript from what we call the Cairo Geniza, which we'll talk more about um, in our second session. Uh, this is a letter from a mother to her son. The mother was sitting in, was living in Raqqa, uh, today's Syria, um, and she wrote it to her son in Egypt. So uh, written likely by a scribe. There's a lot of interesting research on um, women's letters in Judeo-Arabic, but um, this was um, uh, her thoughts as written to her son. So that's one example. This is Hebrew letters, Judeo-Arabic, a personal letter. Um, what you're looking at here is the script of Moses Maimonides, the Rambam. This is also uh, part of the incredible trove that, that is the Cairo Geniza. Uh, what you see on top, tiny, tiny heading, or not so tiny, but three letters. It's paid, Sadi Lamed, Fossil. In Arabic, it means chapter. This is part of um, the, Ram, the Maimonides, the Rambam, um, his guide for the perplexed. In his, it's an autograph, it's in his script, his own writing. Um, this is a work from the Russian Firkovich collection, also likely collected from Egypt. And um, this is also Judeo-Arabic. This is also the Arabic language, mostly in Arabic script. But if you look carefully in the center of the page, you can see a few words in Hebrew. You see the word Yeshua, Yeshua. You see the word Beit Lechem. This is a... Um, Polemic Against Christianity, part of a work written also by Yaqub al kirkhasani who you met earlier. So this is also Judeo-Arabic, and it happens to be an Arabic script. Um, and this um, is a text that I've done a lot of research on. It's a text called, um, in Hebrew, Toledot Yeshu, um, 
a parody on the life of Jesus, literally in English. It's also a Geniza fragment. And it's a, par a parodical story of the life of Jesus that I've done a lot of work on in Judeo-Arabic. So you see, it's um, a sort of popular level work, sort of a story um, in Hebrew script, but in Arabic. So what does this mean? So what is, I brought you four examples here, and you'll see more in the next two sessions. So what is Judeo-Arabic? Judeo-Arabic is written in Hebrew letters or Arabic letters. Um, it's in the Arabic language. So that's really important when we might talk about different types of script, but the language is Arabic. Um, intermittently, we'll find words in Hebrew and Aramaic. Sometimes these words, by the way, are adapted to suit the form of the Arabic language. So in order to read Judeo-Arabic, you have to be very, very attuned to Hebrew and Aramaic in addition to being very attuned to Arabic. Um, it exists in a wide variety of genres, and we will meet many of them along the way. You saw four of them in the previous slides. And it was, something that I've emphasized over the past hour together, the primary written scholarly language of the Jewish people for 300 or 400 years. And that's not to say that I'm sidelining Aramaic and Hebrew, which are also very important Jewish languages, but during the 300 or 400 years that I'm trying to highlight for you, from the late 9th century till the 12th or 13th century, it was a very, very singularly important Jewish scholarly language. Um, during the period that I'm talking about, Judeo-Arabic is most close to literary Arabic of today. Many of you may be questioning about dialect versus literary Arabic. Jews were likely speaking dialect. Dialects have been a feature of Arabic since the beginning. And Jews were likely speaking dialect, but when they wrote Judeo-Arabic, like the Christians, Muslims around them, they were likely attempting and, and normally succeeding in writing a very high level um, literary Arabic of the type that you would find in other medieval works. This is true for the 300 or 400 years that, that we're covering in this series. In later periods, of course, this changed. So that's, if any of you have in your mind the question about um, dialect versus literary Arabic. Um, so this concludes our session for today. Um, I've explained to you why, how, and when Jews began to use Judeo-Arabic. We've looked at maps that explained, that showed us the idea of the incredible swath of Jewish communities from west to east who used Arabic as their primary spoken, read, and written language. Um, and I hope I've convinced you or begun to convince you why Judeo-Arabic is such a unique Jewish language among the large uh, um, number of Jewish languages that our people have had over the years, that our people have used. Uh, in the next session, I want to talk to you about what this meant for the Jewish bookshelf. And that is why you and I, when we read classical Jewish texts, medieval Jewish texts, whatever we might call today in the religious sphere a Jewish book, why in so many cases, when we read these Jewish books, we are reading works that were shaped by this Arabic revolution. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.